So we have uh, the last section for this podcast is going to be how to read or the benefits of reading. Uh, obviously, we're surrounded by books. Uh, we talk about books a lot. Mm-hmm. I think you and I both put in a pretty considerable amount of pages a week. Um, and, 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 a, and the biggest accusation, I think the reason why we need to talk about this is because we've been accused a lot by various parties that, that we spend too much time reading mm-hmm. and not enough time, you know, doing the work, you know, the quote unquote, the work of the gospel going out and preaching. Um, wh- what would you say to that? Why, why, you know, why do we read? I mean, you even hear, it's just common within modern evangelicalism anyway, mm-hmm. the idea that theology, doctrine, study right. is just kind of seen as like, <clears throat> you know, if you need to go to seminary or whatever, of course, do the bare minimum, get by, do what you gotta do. But as for the average Christian or even the average pastor or the average elder or deacon, it, why do you need to study? Mm-hmm. Uh, why, do you, why do you need to be reading theological tomes? Why do you need to be constantly learning and immersing yourself? And, and it's that exact thing as, you know, you could right. be sitting around reading or you could be doing ministry. Um, whereas they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, I think doing good ministry, as in the works of ministry, such as sharing the gospel, doing good works serving Mm. truly flow out of a heart that has been warmed and regenerated obviously by the holy spirit but warmed and then uh and enlivened by sound doctrine sound teaching as it it says in uh timothy that we referenced earlier right that all scripture is breathed out by god Mm. and profitable for teaching instruction correction right training in righteousness yeah the man of god may be equipped fully ready for every good work or ready, fully equipped for every good work. Mm. And, um, so, so the accusation is why reading, why do you need to study? Why you just have your, always have your nose in a book. Right. Um, you know, you don't need to sit there for extended hours. Um, sometimes it's necessary, but how much time we waste on phones and everything else. If you, if you, you, you take what you can when you have it. A couple minutes here, a couple minutes there. Right. Uh, you can get a lot of reading done. And, and um, reading is important because it keeps us on our toes. It keeps us engaged. It keeps us fresh. It keeps yeah. us uh, enlivened. It keeps us right. um, engaged with, with prayer and with thought and with uh, articulating our faith. Right. Um, and, and people could do... Historically, people have read a lot more, especially since the printing press than yeah. we do in our day. It's funny, we read... Uh, I was I was reading a study, I think it was last year, I, I forget what it was by, it was probably on like New York Times or something. But it was talking about people <clears throat> and smartphones and um, iPads and Kindles and right. all these kinds of things and computers and how we are more inundated with, uh, with text information. Yep. Uh, we're reading more than we ever have been, yet we're worse readers. Yeah. We're less intelligent, we retain less. We... Um, because everything is snippets. Uh, I mean, Twitter, what, it, it, what is it now, 240 characters? It's like 248 or 256, Scott, do you know? Sorry. What? How many characters is uh, Twitter now? Two? I, I don't, I'm not a Twitter guy. Okay, well, I, it, it's, anyway, it's it, it used to be 144. It, it would be laughable. Uh, we were talking, and I think in the first podcast, about how, how uh, literally theologians used to write volumes at each other. Yeah. Now they shoot off tweets. Yeah. And it, it's, regardless, it could be 500 characters and it would still be a disgrace. Yeah. Uh, compared it to, compared to what, what has historically been done. Right. People would, you know, someone would say one thing. Imagine if someone tweeted and someone devoted the next five years of their life to refuting that tweet. That's essentially what they would do to each other. And, mm-hmm. and, and as a result, we got, we got scholarship at a level that, that is unparalleled, mm-hmm. I would say. We don't get that kind of scholarship anymore. And, right. and, and that's the whole point of that article is that mm-hmm. we're reading more than ever, but our reading is shallow. Right. And, and people can't read extended um, you know, books or, or, or arguments anymore. It's hard. Right. Our attention spans so little. And if it's not summed up in 144 characters... Right. Uh, well, well, I'm not going to pay attention that long. I'm going to, you know, maybe skim it or something, but right. th- that skill is largely lost as well. Right. <clears throat> so I think you see so many articles, uh, basically being condensed into the title, like the Babylon Bee. I love the Babylon Bee because it's such, even, even in the, the titles of the pair, you know, the satire, all the information you need to know about that entire article is in the, the headline. Mm. And, and people, I would argue that, that people, uh, 
that post articles on Facebook only read the headline. A lot of them, I bet, yeah. You know, they, they see what they like and they assume that what's in, in the content is what they need to know. And I've actually caught a couple of people out on that uh, within the last month or so. And Really? Yeah, I was like, did you actually read the article that you posted? Because it's actually saying the opposite of what you thought it, right. it said. And um, that's the nature of clickbait. You know, you get people pulled in like that. Um, well, and I've even noticed as I'm, you know, recommending books in my ministry and stuff, uh, probably 2010-ish or something, I really mm-hmm. got into extended study reading and acquiring the library that's around me right now. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed over the years... Um, recommending books to people that kind of stuff people have a hard time mm-hmm. getting back into the flow even after even right after college or in college mm-hmm. some of these students are having trouble reading a reading a book that's 250 300 400 500 900 pages long right i mean 900 page long book is, is difficult and those are usually some of the bigger systematics and stuff that i have but it's yeah. hard for people to get into an argument and a flow of thought and, and stay with it for 30 pages that that used to be just how it was and so that is a skill that needs to be developed in our day. And I think that's why it's profitable to talk about how to do the reading as well as the benefits. So just just for me, the benefits I've seen really quick, they've been kind of talking about um, how to read, some, some ways to get the most benefit out of your reading. Right, right. Some um, things that I read for. Some of the reasons that I read is for devotion. Right. So that my theology is sound because I'm reading past present and future what it's always going to be because they're just the idea behind that is that the history those who don't study history are bound to repeat it right yeah so the doctrines that were false doctrines in the early church have been repeated time and time again and will be repeated time and time again that's why if you read the past you're already reading the future it's going to have a different dress on right but it's going to be the same thing uh just repackage we're even seeing that now with andy stanley i don't know if you watched the dividing line I haven't Pretty watched crazy. it, but, but that, I'll, I'll watch it later. Well, he said he needed two Gospels and First Corinthians. That's it. He said that. Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, I'll have to watch that. And, uh, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away that he still has a pulpit. I mean, I'm not. Well, can, I, can I read my quote again? <laughs> uh, well, and to speak to that a little bit, I mean, you have, like, some people don't know that Pentecostalism pretty much started as Unitarianism, oneness, and then it transformed into AOG and everything that mm-hmm. it is now. Uh, and you you have you have modalism and you have uh, the 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 Wesleyanism and and everything and the way that impacted culture mm. and people think that that you can just you know you can you can keep doing the same thing over and over and expect that something else will be a product of the same bad theology mm. and, and and people tend to think well theo- in this day and age theology is so personal uh, you know you don't you, no one shares the theology anymore. Uh, except for the Reformed churches. Um, the Everyone's theology is personal. Mm-hmm. What you believe is the only thing that matters as long as at the end... You know, and whenever you hear a Christian say at the end of the day, just just tune out. Yeah, You're probably going to hear something ridiculous. Because mm-hmm. they'll say something, well, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you go to church. It doesn't matter if you believe the Bible even. All that matters is you have a personal relationship with God. The God who gave us his word that you're now neglecting? At the end of the day. You know, you, you have these sort of blanket statements really being made a lot. And that's, uh, you can, it, if you have a basic brief understanding of church history, you would never make that claim. Well, you even hear people say, well, you know, at the end of the day, or, you know, all I really need to worry about is my relationship with God. As long right. as I know what I believe before God, then it doesn't really matter if, if men think I'm wrong. Right. Well, that flies in the face of what you just said first, because if if it is... They say that first as if it's like, well, I only really need to worry about what God thinks about my theology. Right. That's the scariest part. <laughs> yeah. You should, that, that should be the part where you're like, man, I really hope I got it right because yeah. this is how God has revealed himself and I am now treating him as how I have perceived him to be in his word. So if what I've perceived is incorrect, then I'm actually talking to a caricature of God that I'm putting upon him and saying, God, this is how you have to be and this is how I'm going to treat you. Right. Which that's terrifying. Right, and, and there's there's so much. There there's so many. You go back to the early church, even you study Gnosticism, and you mm. see, uh, I I had someone who had no idea what Gnosticism was. They went and looked at a Wikipedia article, <laughs> and and ba- and I was I was making a parallel to the type of uh, claims that this guy was making. I'm like, that sounds really Gnostic, like the 
you know, the appeal to secret knowledge and the appeal mm. to higher knowledge and this appeal that there's like a, there's like a seven, you know, an upper class, an upper echelon of mm. believers, which is, which is fundamentally, you know, what, what these Gnostics in the early church believed. Right. Uh, and, and while they also believed in a mother God and, you know, all sorts of iterations, you know, uh, an ethereal Jesus that you could put your finger through. And, Wow. Um, he was basically saying uh, that 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 because they didn't believe the exact same things that Gnostics believed, they weren't Gnostic. Right. And 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 it's just the ignorance. It's the ignorance that that you you don't know enough about what you're doing because you're not reading. Right. And and that's the, and that's that's ultimately um, the the point that I wanted to draw was mm. that, that you know how do you know what historic orthodoxy is? Right. If you don't if you don't read through uh, church history, you don't read through some of these guys. Like people don't realize, like uh, a lot of systematic theologies talk about the what they were interacting with at the time. So you actually get like a, a bit, good systematic theology will deal with church history. Yeah, you you, you actually deal with a, a bit of church history in systematic uh, volumes. Right. Uh, and, and I mean, even they recognize you cannot do theology in a bubble. Right. Uh, you have a lot of people that say, "Well, only I only read the Bible," and and, and they're usually the ones that have very scary theology. <laughs> uh it's you know especially if the only bible they read has you know is a particular study bible that's very slanted one way or another Schofield. Uh, oh <laughs> there's also uh, there's also i just figured out there's a there's a kjv only ist study bible there's three oh there's, good there's the uh ruckman reference that's bible the one i just found out about this ruckman, week. yeah and um gosh where's the one it's uh it's that's like, the big i think one. it's the bible believers common or the bible believers bible study yeah. bible Believers Study Bible, something like that. It's a it's written by a guy in Indiana, and uh, yeah. Anyway. So <laughs> there, yeah, there's some catered to specific cultish ide- uh, yeah. ideologies and theologies. But that's the application I wanted to make. I, I just wanted to say, like, as far uh, as far as the cool thing is, this text does not change, yeah. and and the fact that there have been so many distortions of the text, which it talks about uh, in Second Timothy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the fact that there's been so much, we need to know what true north is. What has the Orthodox Church always believed mm. uh, so that we can arm ourselves and defend ourselves and understand, um, mm. you know, it's not necessarily to distill what the Bible says, but to distill what the Bible does not say. Mm. I would say that's a huge importance of reading um, because a lot of these volumes around us, you know, some of them are even addressing what the Bible doesn't say. Yeah. Um, addressing addressing people that they would call heretics, which I would call heretics too. But apparently, you're not allowed to call uh, people heretics anymore. What's well, mean? It might hurt somebody's feelings. Right. Anyway, th- that's all I had to say. Uh, I think what we were going to do, you wanted to teach us, you know, how to read. Yeah. And then we were going to go through a couple of suggestions of books for people. Yeah. Yeah. So, how to read, and this goes into why I read. I, I and we talked. You talked about this recently as well. You, you introduced everyone to the new conversation partner that you've kind of chosen for your for your yeah. rest of your life <laughs> for Kuiper. is uh, uh abraham kuiper yeah um and i think one of the ways i really got into theology and studying you know these volumes of the puritans and uh charles spurgeon and, and so many others is because i love to talk about god i talk yeah. about god all the time i talk about faith and theology and, and things like that all the time that's mostly what i talk about yeah because it gives me life so when no one else was around to talk about with well i have this dead guy or this guy who's still alive but he wrote it down for me so i can interact with him and i'd read with a pen in my hand yeah and a highlighter and same, yeah. or a notepad if you don't like to write in books and know some people don't and you interact with the author you interact yeah. with the book you underline you you highlight you draw question marks you, you put symbols in there, you, you write notes, you interact, you, you make it a living experience that gets you engaged into the text. Yeah. There, are, there are books that I'll read very quickly without doing much writing. In. Sometimes you have to to get through it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and it just depends why I'm reading the book. But right. a lot of the books that I study in depth, I will study very slowly. I'm pretty slow reader anyway. But it slows me down a lot because to, to sit down with a pen in hand. Right. Um, or even a couple different colored pens and, and write and think and uh, digest the material as you were talking about earlier. Mm, yeah. And so that's one of the ways to, to read is mm. to read with a pen in your hand. I think it was Abraham. No, I was almost just going to say Abraham Kuyper again, Ben you, Franklin. You, you can They're very him. different. Ben Franklin, and Abraham can... Kuyper, very different people. But Ben Franklin said, you should always read with a pen in your hand. Yeah. And, 
on, on the topic of reading too, Charles Spurgeon, I wanted to say this earlier, Charles Spurgeon said that people will go, oh, well, I need is the Bible. I don't need other men's thoughts. I don't need other men's interpretations. Uh, I just need the Bible. Well, <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon said, he who, <laughs> he who does not read shall not be read. <laughs> Meaning, if, if you're not going to, and, and he said, and he who expects the Holy Spirit to reveal to him new things, but doesn't want to read what the Holy Spirit revealed to men of old, shall not have anything revealed to him at all. So the whole point is, you know, to, to interact and to know your subject. Yep. So that's why I read the pen in my hand, and that's probably one of my first tips, is read the pen in your hand, slow down. It's okay to, to go through a book really slowly. Yeah. Um, a lot of these books around me, um, and I'll recommend, we're both going to recommend some books. Um, some are harder to read than others, mm -hmm. but a lot of the books that I read, when I started reading the Puritans, I couldn't read very well, and mm -hmm. so reading the Puritans are hard anyway. And uh, Joel Beakey talks about this a lot, Dr. Beakey. He'll talk about how when he was 14 and he came under a strong conviction of sin reading the Puritans, that he every night would be up till 1 in the morning reading, and, and he would say... I read very slowly because I wrote with a pen in my hand mm -hmm. and I looked up every scripture reference and I thought about what they were saying. Yep. It's okay if you sit down and read for a half hour to an hour at once a day and then you realize you're only getting two pages a day. That's okay. You're not in a rush. The, the, what good is it to read 900 pages in a month if you have retained maybe 20 of those pages? Yeah. If that. Yeah. So the goal is to maximize your profit from right. the work you're putting into it. Right. <clears throat> Another way is to read prayerfully, mm -hmm. read on your knees. Um, right. This is what I call it, but uh, literally, too George fat, fat to do that. Yeah, now, me but... too. Uh, George Whitfield, um, he, after he came out of his legalism and perfectionism, and mm -hmm. actually came to saving faith in Christ, what he did mm -hmm. is he said, though exhausted at the end of the day, he would spend every night. For at least four hours on his physically on his knees mm. with his Greek Testament, his English Bible, and Matthew Henry's commentary for four hours every night, and that's how he then got the power from the ministry that you saw. And he would just pray. He would read prayerfully. He would read it in the Greek, read it in the English, read the comment from Henry upon it, and then turn all of that into a prayer. He said he would do that for every paragraph sentence and word i actually uh i i when the first time i had seen that or heard that from someone uh when i would do my devotions i would write a page of devotions uh, of prayer mm -hmm. uh, basically getting myself ready for the the text that i was about to get into whether mm -hmm. it be from scripture or from someone that i was just reading and so i have just like a giant folder really yeah just that's cool <laughs> so hopefully you know someday my, my, my goal is that, that I w I'm such a note taker and that I'm, I'm such a documenter that when I'm dead and gone, my children will find just a stash of me, mm -hmm. you know, in my relationship with the Lord and that the, you know, that I would be remembered for that. Well, that would, I, that's a, that's a horror story for most of the Puritans. We actually have so much Puritan literature <laughs> that we could have had that when they died, they burned their, a lot of their I, diaries. I remember that. I know that. Yeah. yeah, yeah because they, they, they kept, they kept very strict prayer journals and prayer diaries right and, and diaries of all sorts but usually they were burned when they died because right um they didn't want anybody reading that that was their relationship with god right right that was right. Their, that was what they called the ark and they didn't want anybody touching it because they were afraid that person would get struck down so they would have it <laughs> so they would have it burned um but that's how seriously they took it but yeah yeah I yeah, mean, yeah. The, the, yeah, the thought the thought of it is that, that you know I when I go through a book I, I do my my notes in a in a little moleskin and I, I leave the moleskin in my bookshelf in between that book and the next one, and yeah. and so that you know uh, I always joke around with my wife I say well if they don't want to read the whole volume they can at least read my hor <laughs> horrible note taking of what's in it, um, yeah but that's but I mean this is a this is an example I don't know if you guys will be able to see that but. You know, the book I'm reading right now, there's notes and underlinings and different colors and highlights and things like that. So I just, I really interact with the text. You know, you, you know, sometimes I just write amen, um, or this guy's an idiot, or where did he get this idea, or wow, I never heard it this way. Yeah. So it's that kind of stuff. And um, some pastors and students are, are much better at this, being able to then systematize those notes right. and those thoughts. 
Um, usually they get left in the book and the book goes back on the shelf and I forget what I even said, you know, yeah, but, but the, yeah. the, it, it's not lost because it's not only in the margin, but it's also in my heart and in my memory from right. my interaction with the Lord. So I would say read with a pen in your hand. Hmm. Some people want to, and you're, th- you're thinking about doing this with Brocco is actually read through it once yep. without taking any notes. Yep. Pray or whatever you need to do, but just read it at a normal pace. Mm-hmm. Then go back and read it slowly, taking notes and yep. underlining and things like that. And then some people will then, in the end sheets of their book, kind of map out the, the book. Yep, that's, that's that's the plan so far. And then read yeah. it again. I, I know people that sometimes will read a book five times before they move on from the book. Like, if they really want to know that book, they don't do that for every book. But. I think the, the, only, the only one I've really done that with is uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. It was probably... Mm-hmm. That was the only... Uh, when I first... Uh, was saved that 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 I thought that Wayne Grudem's systematic theology was the only theological yeah. work that existed. I didn't. I Did didn't, you really? I think yeah. I think we both thought that because I remember I saw this. I think I even told you about that, and I was yeah. like, I was like, dude, I got systematic theology as if it was like that's it. That's it. There's because like one. I would hear, I would hear people talking about it like online, like Paul Washer and mm-hmm. whoever else would listen to John McCarthy, and they'd say system the word systematic theology or the word systematic. We theology. thought it was Wayne Grudem. Like, I we thought, thought that's that what was... he meant. Well, that, there it is, right there on the title, systematic theology. So that must be what they're talking about. But yeah, I mean that this was my introduction to any kind of yeah real theological so i probably burnt through that four or five times yeah, mine's uh, like falling apart yeah, and, yeah which is uh yeah i've read the whole thing once and little little did i know that that was just i that was just an introduction to everything i'd be reading over the next 10 years yeah that's awesome so do you have so any other to know me has been like uh over the years remaining friends with me has been detrimental to your wallet because of um yes that's relative <laughs> to my wallet and also to my uh the, the part of me that wants to Easy. have any sort of free time um the uh uh oh so you have so do you have any other suggestions on how to read uh before we move on to our suggestion what about um i don't know what do you, what do you have because i said read mm-hmm. prayerfully read slowly uh-huh. and kind of talked about different things people do what, what have you done besides like when you read okay say when you read grudem four times yeah well how did you do that so the first time I, with a highlighter in hand, I just highlighted. I read the whole thing through highlighted. And then the second time I realized that a systematic theology doesn't have to be read cover to cover. Mm-hmm. And so I went through kind of out of order and took notes on each section, each chapter. And then the third time I read it, no pen, no highlighter. Mm. I just wanted to kind of see. So I would read the titles and be like, okay, what, I ret- what do I retain from this? Mm. Like, what do I actually remember from any of this? And then the fourth and fifth time was pretty much just the oh, same. Five. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. The first year was three times that I read. Oh, wow. Remember, remember, I told you that I was yeah. like, I think, I think I've read Rain, Wayne Grudem three times this year. Yeah. And, and you, you, you probably thought it was silly. Like, there's other books. There's, there's other books. Well, I just, read. I thought you were kidding. No. I thought you were speaking hyperbole. Honestly. No, I was actually, yeah. I actually read it all. Uh, Wayne Grudem. If you're listening, you need to send him a free copy of your new book on ethics. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, he'll, no, read, he'll read it six times. Well, the, the re- well, first of all, like I said, I was kind of joking, but kind of not. I literally thought that when I was, what, 18? I literally thought that Wayne Grudem was the only, like, theological work. Right. Because yeah, you right. go to Barnes & Noble, and that's pretty much it. Like, I mean, you'll, you'll see some stuff by Pope Benedict and, uh, well, now Frankie. <laughs> Um, or, you know, yeah, that was, if, if they have anything, it's, so I was unaware of, of like these, you know, these, these publishing companies in the Midwest and, and out, you know, and, and Dutch reformed land and every, everywhere out there. Uh, I just wasn't aware of these guys. Mm-hmm. I wasn't either. And I, I literally thought that, that the only theological works that existed were at Barnes and Noble. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would go to Barnes and Noble and I would try to find, you know, something that wasn't Joyce Meyer or Joel Osteen. Cause I knew they were bad somehow. Like I knew that that wasn't good. Um, and so we came up with Wayne Grudem and Matthew Henry's commentary. I mean, those are pretty good takeaways, especially Matthew Henry. I mean, that's, right. that's a, you could read that cover to cover right. the rest of your life if, if you had nothing else and you would be in a long line of godly men who have done the I, same thing. I, I, uh, I love Matthew. So let's get into, the, so, so my, if I were to give one piece of advice from my perspective, cause I, I, I tend to read really fast, uh, and I have to slow myself down. Um, like I've, uh, I did my Bible reading plan in a year by March and uh, that was like note taking and stuff, uh, just because I read really fast and then I, I'll reread again five or six times and like that. Just I can't be slow when I read or else I, I get distracted and fall asleep and everything. 
Um, so I, I just, if I miss something, I just read it again and read it again and read it again. It's really weird. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing, but what I would recommend for people is, is don't be afraid to stop yourself in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a paragraph, in the middle of a chapter, and just start over. Yeah. Uh, the goal isn't just to get through it, it's to right, benefit from it. Right. And in whatever way you do that, if, if speed reading through it one or two times is faster for you than reading it word by word by word, um, if you can pull more, like figure out how you read, how you can pull the most meaning from the text. Mm -hmm. And for me, what that looks like is I, I, I'll, I'll go through a section and I identify the, the content of a section. And fortunately, a lot of books I'm reading right now are sectioned off. So you mm -hmm. don't actually have to do that yourself. Uh, but I'll read it fast once or twice. And then I'll read it slow and I'll read it fast again. Uh, and then I'll read it back to my, and I'll, I'll summarize it to myself and say, okay, mm -hmm. what does this say? Summarizing is huge. Mm -hmm. It's a good tool to be able to do is right. to read a paragraph or two mm -hmm. and then be able to summarize right. or even a page or a chapter. If you're able to summarize a chapter, that means you really understood it. Right. And and sometimes even in in the at the end of a chapter, if there's there's usually space, like a blank page or half a page, uh, in a lot of books that I'm I've read at least and I, I write down like five notes. Mm -hmm. Um, five takeaways. And uh I I would say that the biggest detriment to me my reading is the fact that I do need to speed read sometimes to get through stuff because mm -hmm. uh, I do miss a lot if I don't reread it four or five times. And so, um, well, I mean, even in uh, when I was in my, one of my Latin courses, mm -hmm. we did that. I would, you were, you would read a chapter multiple times. It was usually like a story in right. Latin or a dialogue in Latin. And then you would summarize in your own Latin words. So yep. you would read, then you would write a summary in Latin on that. Yep. Uh, I, I think if you can write, and I, I tell this to people all the time, if you can write just a quick little five sentence summary of what you just read, uh, or you can explain it. I do this all the time. This is actually a reading tip. This is uh, when I'm driving in the car with my wife, uh, I will just summarize what I've just read to her. But I'll, I'll do it in conversation form. Mm. So I, I can actually just, you know, really understand it and be able to articulate it in conversation. Because that's, uh, so primarily, you know, teaching someone what you've just learned mm. helps you solidify it. Yeah. And then also being able to be conversational mm -hmm. in your information, thats I think that's a huge key. Yeah, and it's a, one last thing before we get to the um, recommendations <laughs> is, is on that exact same note. It's, yeah. it's don't be afraid when you're reading through something, and everyone does it where you're reading and your mind wanders, and then you get to the end of the page and you're like, what did I just read? Yeah. It's okay to, sometimes it's disheartening, but it's okay to be like, okay, I'm going to go back to where I was. Yep. Um, but it's also okay to be like, okay, I'm going to keep going. It depends on what you want to be getting out of it and, right. uh, and everything else. But it's okay to ad admit that you weren't paying attention for a minute and then go back. I would say that's the best thing that, that, yeah. I, that I do for myself. Because yeah. I, I, you know I read too fast. I burn through stuff. Yeah, I, I, sometimes you tell me how much you've read that week and I'm like, you're a liar. <laughs> or you're like literally just looking at the page. Because like the only person I've ever heard, nah, whatever, I could go into a whole story about Charles Spurgeon. I'm not going to. Another Spurgeon, time. Spurgeon was insane. Let's go to uh, some of our uh, recommended reading. Um, first off, the Bible, obviously, is the book you're wanting to be reading the most. Um, figuring out a, a reading plan. Some people yep. have a yearly reading plan where they read through the Bible twice or once in the Old Testament, Psalms and New Testament twice. Mm -hmm. Um Whatever you're going to do, stick to it as much as you can. <laughs> Mine get kind of crazy just because I'll be uh, in one Bible, one Bible or another, excuse me, um, or in my Greek Testament, my Hebrew, all that kind of stuff. So right. I have to kind of figure out what I'm doing. But mm -hmm. obviously, the Bible. Make sure that's your main reading. Can I add a suggestion to that? Yeah. Uh, read a uh, high-quality Bible um, with l I, luxury leather. I mean... Um, I would say that's the Liter way Okay, it. literally though, it's funny. Literally though, people I've met that I've then been like, I've either given them a high quality Bible or recommended they get one and they got one as a gift or bought it themselves. They always then are encouraged to read more. I don't I don't think that's a, you don't have to have a high quality right, Bible. Right. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's funny and it's, uh, maybe it's the wrong reason to be reading, but either way, they're reading the words. So. Right. Um, but, I find in Arizona, those glue bound ones really fall apart too, very easily. And if you leave oh, them in the well, car yeah. once, they're done. Yes. I mean, I've literally had not even just Bibles, but books, but especially Bibles. Yeah. Like back when we were buying Bibles all the time, because yeah. like that's all I was, guys, those cheap glued ones. From, $40 a month on Bibles? <laughs> from, from, from Barnes, Barnes and & Noble. Noble. Yeah. We'd get the cheap glued ones. They have a better selection nowadays, but yeah, in Arizona, summer, 100, 
130, 135 degrees in your car, you leave your Bible in there, gone. When you get back, it's literally just you open it up and pages just come out. It's curled so, over on itself. Yeah, it's so crazy. Sad. So sad. Um, quick recommendations. Uh, Family Worship Bible Guide by Reformation Heritage Books, Joel Beakey, and uh, others put this together. The Reformation Heritage KJV Study Bible um, mm. has in its footnotes, it's a great study Bible. Even if you don't use the King James necessarily, you could use, I use the study notes every day just in my reading with my ESV. So I use the study notes regardless and often I'm looking at the King James as well, but they realize that in their notes they have at the end of each chapter reflections for personal and family worship. So questions, mm -hmm. thoughts, everything to make it very applicable, how to turn to a prayer, questions, all that kind of stuff. They realize that um, it would actually serve the church a lot better if they then took those family worship, family yep. and personal worship notes and put them into a book. So yep. it's separate from the rest of the study Bible. And so that's what this is. They have a hard they have a hardcover version that's a little bit cheaper. But go to reformationheritagebooks.com. You can also find it on Amazon, but it's Family Worship Bible Guide. Um, you see Joel Beakey's name on it. And also uh, Reformation Heritage Books. You found it. This is a bonded leather version. Really nice. But it, it, it's an amazing thing. We do this uh, nightly with my wife and I. Valley of Vision. Book of Puritan Prayers. So I got good. this. I got this for all my groomsmen yep. in 2013. Um, but it's, it's it's been a daily friend ever since. When did I get this? 2013 is when I got mine as well. I think you bought us all. Yeah. Yeah. Same time. Well, I had already bought it and read some of it. That's why I was like, oh, I need to get this for you guys. Yeah. Um, I actually uh, would carry mine around in my travel bag. Like just goes, I, it yeah, goes, still, goes with me everywhere. I still. Yeah. I, I go through seasons where I use it every morning, and basically what I do is I pray. I read the prayer, um, sometimes just as a devotion. Other times I read it and base my own prayer off it. Right. Um, so, I mean, people use it for different reasons, different ways, but it's perfect. Um, what other, do you have some book recommendations that we can maybe go back and forth? Uh, yeah, sure. So I split mine into four different categories, uh, and I tried to be uh, selective because I could recommend a lot of books that, that have really blessed me. But well, I think every Christian in in their lifetime or preferably early on uh in their faith needs to get through a systematic theology mm. um, i think that's that's fundamental mm. especially if you were not catechized as a child as a child mm. if you didn't you know go through it if you weren't raised in a family that did family worship and didn't um raise you up in the scriptures this is the 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 most urgent thing you could possibly do mm. I'm, I'm not even kidding yeah you need to get into a systematic theology People that, that, that read systematic theologies uh, have so, so much more foundation for mm. how to read their Bible. They have so much more of a foundation on, on the doctrines that exist, the topics that exist in the Bible, mm. and how to properly view the scriptures in, in light of those topics, mm. um, or I guess those topics in light of the scriptures. Right, right. Um, but I would say, I kind of break this into three sort of categories. If you're in the category of, of you've never really read anything theological, uh, before Wayne Grudem, systematic theology. Yeah. If you're uh, a Presbyterian or Dutch Reformed, uh, Louis Burkhoff, or if mm. you're brave, Bob Inc. Um, <laughs> but Louis Burkhoff is essentially a, you know, basically a, it's, it's drinking. It's just drink. Yeah. It, it's Bob Inc. Light is what. Yeah. It's call a diet it. diet Bob Inc. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, Bob Inc. hadn't been translated yet, and so and then. Reading Bob Inc. is like drinking from a fire hose, is what they say. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. And then, and then the last systematic theology that I'll recommend uh, would be if, if you're of the Reformed Baptist tradition or the Baptist tradition or non-denominational even, um, which essentially just means mostly some form of Baptist. Right. Uh, uh, get into um, James P. Boyce abstract to systematic theology. It's it's essentially imagine like the cliff notes for a systematic theology. That's what it feels like reading. Very clear. It's super clear, super to the Lots point. Lots of scripture references. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like a systematic catechism. Like, well, he has a catechism in the back. Yeah, I know. In that edition. Awesome. I, I, I have the cheapo one. You can literally get the, the worst one for like $11, so it's actually quite a, quite a uh, good buy if you um, have 10 bucks. And then and I'll uh, recommend one more systematic theology. Oh yeah, Martin Lloyd Jones sermons on systematic theology. They nice. put it. It was published originally in three volumes. Now it's in one. Crossway puts it out. It's called Great Doctrines of the Bible. Right. So the original doctrines were God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the last volume was the Church and the Last Things. Who would you recommend that systematic to? Like like what what's your audience for that one? 
somebody who's already pretty familiar with uh, the faith, probably. Um, yeah. Um, or, or somebody who's like, okay, those are a little bit too daunting, the ones that you um, gave even. Those are a little bit too daunting. This is his sermons. Right. On systematic theology. And so they're very just practical, very conversational, easy to read, but still right. depth, still deep. So Martin Lloyd-Jones, yeah. uh, Great Doctrines of the Bible. So the next category that I broke it down to was Christian living. Mm. Uh, and I'm not going to give you one that you can find at Barnes & Noble. Uh, the So this one was tough for me. I, I either wanted to uh, do, well, there's three. Uh, the Christian Complete Armor. Uh, was the was was one of the first ones I thought of, and then Mortification of Sin by John Owen, and then uh, the third one, uh, Holiness by J.C. Ryle, and I, I ended up picking Mortification of Sin by John mm. Owen. Uh, that you you can't not read that. That that's so. I try to read it once every year or so. I try to get mm. if I can or parts of it at least. In 2013 and 14, I read it five times. It's only 82 pages, so it's, it's really short because yeah. It, yeah, it's it's really short. But, it's but in, in volume six of his writings, and you can also mm-hmm. find it, I think, in Temptation and Sin. Crossway right. published a, just one volume that was... The first time I read it, I found it for free on Kindle, I'm pretty sure. So, I, I yeah. like, literally, you can get it anywhere. It's easy to get it, yeah. Get your hands on it. Uh, and it, really, when I say Christian living, I, I think that Christians need to stop reading this garbage. Uh, that's that, 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 like, practical 10 steps to this, mm. 12 steps to that. You got to cut that out. Mm-hmm. Stop doing it. Uh, read read works that that tell you to push into Christ, to push into pursuing Him, and 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 to be holy and righteous uh, before Him. And you, you can't, you just can't take ten steps to that. Right. You know. And and I think the Puritans were the the last people to really understand Christian living. I mean, yeah, they call it the golden age of Christian uh, literature. So I would say stop going to Barnes and Noble for your Christian living literature and and just start going and reading Puritans. <laughs> right no, and we're completely out of time, like way over time even. Are we? We're gonna go short, and I think we went long. We just we, um, we got talking about books, and we, yeah, we can't. No, yeah. we can't do that ever again. Um, <laughs> just on that note, really quick, uh, this is the Christian Complete Armor by War- William Gurnall, Puritan. Yeah. Um, it's it's a hefty read. It's twelve hundred pages of. <laughs> Tiny print, double column. Well, not tiny, just small print, double column. There isn't a better book, in my opinion, and I am in the same league as... Or in the same group, not in the same league. In the same group of thinking <laughs> with um, Charles Spurgeon and John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. Did you they just... both said, yeah, I'm not in the same league at all. Good grief, oh. I wish. Um, and so they both said if they could do with... If they could only have one other book besides the Bible, it would be The Christian Complete Armor by William Gurnall. So... Um, I try to read this decent volume every couple of years, and I just got a one-year reading thing where you, it's you read five days a week and give you two days to catch up. Anyway, read this amazing best book I've ever read, and then the Puritan paperback series is all about just Christian living. So the Puritan paperback series put out by Banner of Truth. Yep. This one's just John Fla- Flavel. Um, John Flavel. You can you can um, get these. They're cheap. They're easy to read. They're amazing. Charles Spurgeon, also Banner of Truth. You can find pretty much anything you find by him. Try to make sure that it's not updated language. It, he's just better in the original, and he's not hard to read. I don't know why they updated, but he's gold. Um, and also, Soli Deo Gloria Publishers. Soli Deo Gloria Publications does a bunch of Puritan reprints as well, all in, like, retypeset, um, yeah. fixed grammar, things like that. Just, I mean, this, this book was only... 144 pages and it's on the penitent pardon so how to be repentant and everything and and so they're just all super applicable super immediately practical yep and um really encouraging so yep and the last one quickly i will say if you don't have a study bible get the esv study bible and if you don't have a commentary get matthew henry's commentary mm. that's that's yeah. the last i i think i think if you especially if you're if you're kind of new into studying the bible I need you need a good study Bible, and it, and it is the ESV study Bible. So that's the one. It's the chosen one. It's the it's the <laughs> elect study Bible, <laughs> the elect study version. But I will say, I think I think it's the it's the best the best. Yeah, I mean, yeah, especially for intro into right. You don't know exactly where you stand in in terms of Reformed theology and stuff. That's a good right. one. So all right, well that that's been it. I know that we went a lot longer. If you're into <laughs> books, you're gonna love this episode. 
Uh, hopefully, uh, Scott can cut this part so it's like we just have the book section too, though, right? So every time we go to say something, whatever, it just cuts to the next section. <laughs> uh, the, so thank you for joining us this week on the Agri Church Podcast. I'm Ruling and Teaching Elder Taylor DeSoto, and I'm Lead Pastor Dan Johansson, and we'll see you next week.